John Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm presenting some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literature and cultural studies. This particular installment is one of a group that I've prepared for my introductory course on literary theory. And here I'm going to say some things about the impact of structural linguistics on literary theory and cultural theory more broadly. Structural linguistics originated at the beginning of the 20th century in the work of the Swiss linguist Ferdinand de Saussure. So I'll begin by situating Saussure's intervention in relation to the traditional linguistics of the 19th century. Linguistics, or the scholarly study of language, emerged in the 19th century as a field of study focused on the historical derivation and origins of vernacular languages. The search for the deep roots of modern languages was initiated in the late 18th century by Sir William Jones. Jones was a civil servant in British colonial India, and he was also a brilliant linguist. He noticed that there were commonalities among cognate words in many different languages. For example, the English word for father is similar to the words for father in other European languages, and also similar to the words for father in Latin, in ancient Greek, and even in Sanskrit. From this observation, Jones proposed the theory that all of these languages derived from a common ancestor language, even though no actually existing evidence remained of this ancestor language, its existence could be identified by the existence of cognate words and grammatical structures in different languages that were known. This projected ancestor language is called Proto-Indo-European. Here's a chart demonstrating the similarities among very common ordinary everyday words in these different languages. The heading PIE in the left-hand column stands for Proto-Indo-European, the projected root language from which these other languages, English, Gothic, Old Norse, Latin, Ancient Greek, Sanskrit, must have derived. It's worth noting in passing that the scholarly interest in the roots of modern European languages flourished at the time in which European nations, like Germany, for example, were being formed and consolidated as modern nation-states from dukedoms and other more provincial regional units. In general, the concept of the modern nation-state depends on a cultural linguistic heritage shared among its citizens. This is least apparent, perhaps, in a multicultural nation like the United States, with citizenship founded on the shared commitment to a concept articulated in a constitution. Its most dangerous, most ethnocentric and racist form is characteristic of fascist states like Nazi Germany. 19th century historical linguistics took for granted the relationship between words and the things or concepts to which they referred. This relationship was not at issue for these historical linguists. But Ferdinand de Saussure made a radical break from this tradition. In his book entitled A Course in General Linguistics, published by two of his former students a few years after he died, Saussure asked a different kind of question, not what are the historical origins of this language, but instead how is meaning made in actual usage of this language system. Traditional linguistics took for granted the relationship between the word or sign and the object or concept that the sign pointed to, the meaning, or the signified. But Saussure argued that there is no necessary connection between the sign and its signified. The relationship is arbitrary. Meaning-making depends simply on a tacit agreement between a speaker and an audience. Let me try to demonstrate this with a simple example using our sign for a small, furry, four-legged domestic animal. So here on the left side of the screen, you'll see a graphic that you'll recognize as letters spelling out the English word cat with an arrow pointing to a drawing meant to represent a cat. A traditional way of understanding the relationship represented here is that the word cat has meaning 
because it refers to or points toward a cat. The word or the sign is a reflection, we might say, of the thing that it refers to. But Saussure says that the relationship between the word cat, the sign on the left, and the picture of the cat, the sign on the right, is arbitrary. The word cat has meaning for us because of its difference from other possible signs, because it represents a recognizable and repeatable difference from words like bat, rat, or cap, or cot. And if a community decided to call that image on the right something like cot, cot would work just as well as cat. We can demonstrate that by noting that if we travel around a little bit and go to France, this will become le chat. If we go to Spain, it's el gato. And if we see one of these in India, it might be a bili. At least I hope that's the right way to pronounce that word in Hindi. This insight has some interesting implications. For one thing, it emphasizes the social constructedness of meaning, that language and meanings only work in a social relationship. For instance, in certain areas of lower Manhattan in the 1950s, one could utter the word cat, and it would become a sign signifying one of these, a cool cat, to be sure. This framing of language as a social construct implied that human consciousness could be understood as a social construct as well. Although Saussure's application was limited to linguistics, other scholars soon began to apply the method in other areas of the humanities. First, Roman Jakobson, among others, applying the structuralist method to poetry. Claude Lévi-Strauss adapted the structuralist method for studying anthropology, and by the 1950s, Roland Barthes was adapting the method for the study of popular culture. So the structuralist method, stemming from Saussure's structural linguistics, has had far-reaching effects on the humanities throughout the 20th century. I'll be pointing out and elaborating on some of these effects in subsequent webcasts for this course, but I'll conclude this one for now. As always, if you have questions or comments, send me an email. Thank you.